Hi, welcome to New Workforce Hawaii. I'm so excited to be here today and to be co-host of this group that's looking at all the different ways that we can work in Hawaii. And a lot of them are new and emerging. They're not really the same as what we're used to in the past. Uh, you'll see on the bottom of your screen uh, a website, newworkforcehawaii.com. New Workforce Hawaii was founded by Carlene McKay, a national speaker in the field of aging as well as new ways to work for all ages, millennials all the way up through 90, 95, however old you are. And I'm happy to be a member of that group along with three other founding members. When you go to that website below, you're going to see not only some really interesting information, but also the opportunity to download a free book called Work Future, Work in the Future. And what you'll find in there is that it's really time for you to wake up, look around, and get an idea of what other things you can do besides whatever eight to five you're doing today. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the scary parts about that is that uh, we may not have the choice anymore just to work in a regular job. A lot of those are going away to robotics and other things as they come along. Uh, but today we're going to focus on, and I'm really, really thrilled to have as my guest, Dr. Jackie Young. And Jack, Jackie is a, a force to be reckoned with for advocacy for women and girls. And she has spent her life doing a lot of work in that regard, as well as uh, you may recognize her name from being um, on the House of Representatives for Kailua Waimanalo a while back. Jackie, um, well, I guess we're going to ask you a bunch of questions today. Sure. Yeah. And Jackie, is we've asked her to talk about secrets of reinvention, her secrets of reinvention over her life. Why I think that's such a great thing for us to have the opportunity to do is that, uh, you know how they say necessity is the mother of invention? You know, necessity is the mother of invention. That's how the... the um, post-it note was built, right? It was just a mistake, but necessity brought it on. Well, <coughs> Jackie's one of the mothers of reinvention. So uh, thank you, Jackie, for being here today. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll hear a little bit about parts of your resume as well as the, the key parts that you think our viewers would really relate to in terms of their own lives, OK? OK. OK, Sounds great. Good. So we'll, we'll get started. Um, let's see. Right now, um, Jackie is on several boards, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. What are some of the boards that you're on right now? Uh, I'm on uh, ACLU's state board mm -hmm. and um, on the Civil Rights Commission, Hawaii State Advisory Commission to the Civil Rights. Wow. And uh, also on the Judicial Selection Commission. And mm -hmm. I was just elected chair of that. Wow, excellent. Yeah. Well, they're lucky to have you as chair. Thank you. Yeah, and then you're also on a national group. Yeah, I um, was re I was appointed by the Secretary of Defense to the uh, Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services. Mm -hmm. So it's a committee that advises Secretary Mattis, uh, Defense Secretary, about integrating women into the military. Wow. And I was so fortunate. I was on this committee in the 1990s mm -hmm. when they had the combat exclusion law and wouldn't allow women into combat positions mm -hmm. except for uh, aviators. They mm -hmm. could fly combat planes. And that was in 1993. And then just recently, a year ago, they repealed that. So now 220,000 jobs Wow. in the military opened up for women. Right. That's a huge new uh, workforce opportunity for women right. in the military. Right, I was reading about that and, yeah. and actually uh, one of the interesting things I think is that you, you're, you're really for fairness and equity, right? right? But you're also for safety, right? For exactly. people in various job categories yeah. and things like that. And uh, that's one of the other things, you know. Do you want to say anything more about that? Well, I, I want to talk about DACA was in the sense that, to me, that's going to revolutionize the workforce. When you mm -hmm. see women moving into positions they never had before, right. you know, in combat, in uh, ranger school, in the SEALs, and yeah. it's going to be hard for them in the beginning right. because they haven't trained for that. But when they get in that, it's going to revolutionary, uh, be revolutionary in what women can do. Mm -hmm. So it just opens up a whole new field. Well, that's an excellent point. Yeah. And um, I think also in terms of um, the future of, uh, like, I think it's over 49% of all the degrees that are gradu our graduate degrees are earned by women now, right? Yes. So in terms of what we can do as a force, not against men, but in terms of parity, equity, mm -hmm. and the future of womanhood, right? 
we should be able to do some things. Exactly. And an example of that is in the judiciary. You know, there's been a call for more women judges, yep. and over 50% of the law school students are women. Right. So why isn't that happening? And I think part of that falls into, frankly, some of the traps we fall into. And that, that has been the theme of my whole life. Okay. about traps and how to get out of them. <laughs> oh, well, that's, this sounds fascinating, doesn't <laughs> no, it? But, yeah. So, uh, well, tell me w the one trap that you personally didn't notice at the time. Okay, oh, yeah. so you're in a trap. Most of us don't notice it right away, right? Sure, they don't So, know. Yeah. a trap you got into, all of a sudden you woke up, you were like, what? What's going on and yeah. how did you get out of it? Well, you know, it's our culture and government that puts us into traps. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, age is a big trap because oh, what yeah. the government tells you, what you can do at a certain age, you can go to kindergarten, certain age, you graduate at a certain age, you go to college at a mm -hmm. certain age. Those are, are, are traps that you have to think your way out of. And yeah. I fell into a lot of those. In fact, what I brought is, you're talking about 20th century, because this is the 21st century, right? That's right. That's this right. was my very first degree that I got, and it's from oh the YWCA gosh. in Advanced Cake Decorating. You can't really Advanced read it. Advanced Cake Decorating. Advanced Cake Decorating in 1956. Yeah. But oh, that was all I could I get born. at that time, because I had left college to get wow. married, and the only courses available to women were at the YWCA in millinery and sewing and cake decorating. That was a wife trap. Well, you know, you don't go back to school if mm -hmm. you were married. You, mm -hmm. you just stay at home and you do homemaking things. And right. that was all I could get. Well, now, in the 21st century, I looked it up. You can learn how to decorate a cake online. They have courses, and Chris, and you know, I have the too, Apple right? Watch, too. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be a wife. And, in fact, probably our best pastry chefs sometimes are men. That's true. You know, so yeah. what, what's limiting for women is limiting for men also. So. Oh, wait, let yeah. me stop you there. I think that's an excellent point, yeah. right? What's limiting for women is limiting for men. Why? Because it then puts us into these gender roles. And exactly. I know that you have an advanced degree in, in yeah. women's studies, right? But gender roles that trap us all into thinking that we have to be a certain way. And like you were saying, traps of work, traps of marriage, sure. right? Yeah, and way back when I was with the Department of Education doing uh, gender equity issues, mm -hmm. I met the uh, HR person, human resources person from AT&T. Mm -hmm. He was here to give a talk. Mm -hmm. And they were being sued at the time by switchboard operators who were told you had to be female to be a switchboard, uh, switchboard operator and you had to be male to climb the polls. Right, right. So when the women uh, challenged them on that, they had to look at different research on how to have lighter belts, mm -hmm. smaller um, tools that could fit in their hand. Right. What they discovered when they did those things that small men could also qualify to oh, climb there the go. polls. Makes sense. So it opened it up to diversity in the sense that Asian men were smaller than mm -hmm. some of the other big burly men. Mm -hmm. And so it really opened it up to everyone. When you mm -hmm. open it up to women, you open right. it up to a variety of people. Right. You're not limited then by ethnicity right. or gender right you know it's the kind of the blinders are on but then right. they come off and helps more than just the exactly. one group that you're advocating for yeah so right. those inequities are traps yeah. and we have to be aware of them and as I said age is a big trap but um, for me as a housewife which I was for about 15 I didn't get my first job till I was 38 38 oh, wow. years old, no and that was after I got my degree some of my degrees and and, and worked my way up and that was because the Vietnam War was going on. My husband was in the military, and I thought if he died, I had four children, what was I going to do to take care of them? Right. And it was a very practical call, right? decision that I had to finish my college degree. Yep. So I went back to school in my 30s, and, and then my first job at 38 years old. So I wow. didn't want to be caught in that trap of not being educated. So. That was when you were a speech pathologist? Yeah, I became a speech pathologist. and. Uh, I was going to ask you, yeah. um, of all the things you could do uh, besides cake decorating, how did you decide to do speech pathology and audiology? Well, when I went back to school at the University of Hawaii, because I was unclassified, I could only take the leftover classes Aww. at that time. And in high school, I had been on the debate team, so I wanted to go for speech. Right. But a lot of people thought speech was an easy way out, and uh. it was all filled. And the only classes open was speech pathology. Oh, I see. So yeah. I ended up taking the introductory course in speech pathology, and uh. I thought, this is a pretty good field. But one 
once I got in it, I found out you had to have a master's degree in order to utilize it mm -hmm. because it required a higher level of clinical competence. Right. So then I thought, oh my gosh, I've set myself a path to get a higher degree, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that's so the path were you I working, went on. Were you working full time while you did that? Uh, no, I had internships, which ah. was really, oh, really great. useful to me. But yeah. I have to tell you, during this whole period, what got me going back to school what got me to become more active was I read something that Jackie Robinson wrote, mm -hmm. that life is not a spectator sport. You yeah. can't spend your life in the grandstand. You That's have to it. get out on the field. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that because I felt like I was a spectator for so yeah. long right. that I thought I really, and that rung in my ears. I thought I need to get out of this. I need to do something. And, right. and that's what spurred me on. That's great. Well, yeah. I think New Workforce Hawaii, too, one of the themes that we're yeah. trying to broaden out right. is that learning is doing. Yes. And not just, um, and going back to school is a wonderful thing to oh, do. Yeah. Yeah. But these days, you can learn on YouTube and go try exactly. something new. Exactly, like that. Right. Yeah. So you can learn faster, like you were saying about the cake decorating, right. right? Yeah. So this idea of there should be fewer traps, right? Right. No, we get trapped all the time. Like another one is, uh, I consider them conceptual traps. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. Well, I frankly had a dog up to 15 years old. He was constantly <laughs> learning new tricks. I am, you know, it, they think of elderly people. I am constantly looking for new ways to learn because right. to me, Aging means living. Mm -hmm. Living means growing. And I mean, all you have to do is look at your fingernails. They constantly grow, don't they? Yeah, don't you have absolutely. to clip them all the time? That's if you true. didn't, they'd be long. That's so true. that's a sign to you that you're still growing. Right. You know, if you're still growing outwardly, then you need to grow inwardly right. also. You okay. know, so it's a to me being a lifelong learner is super important. You absolutely. Know, to continue to learn and keep yourself relevant. Right, relevance is yeah. the thing. And if we don't learn, we're going to become dinosaurs, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. right. So um, let me ask you this then. Like, you, were you always a lifelong learner from way up? And if, if, if any of our viewers aren't, they don't consider themselves lifetime learners or they're, they're afraid of that, how would you help them to get over that trap? Well, I was a lifelong, when I think about this, and I keep it, you know, I keep it hanging because it reminds me that was what was available at the time. It's amazing. And, you know, yet I continued on that path. So I always had something I was learning, whether it was Chinese cooking, which mm -hmm. I learned, uh, millinery, I learned how to make hats. Wow. Sewing, I learned how to sew, stretch and sew. I learned every method wow. of sewing. Wow. But it was not something that I really loved. And I learned after a while that a career is something that you, have, you set as a goal. You want to be a speech pathologist, a career. But a vocation is something that you truly love and believe in. Oh, and it's right. a calling. The word yeah. vo voca vocare is Latin for vocare, calling. Right. So things called me, and they usually were in my volunteer activities. Mm -hmm. There was something I volunteered for yeah. that called me, but pretty soon they merged together. Mm -hmm. My volunteer work and my career work, so I felt inspired and motivated and able to activate myself. And those right. are key words in my life. To so be. would you say, um, do you know people who weren't really comfortable with learning, who now have made it through the trap, or have you helped other people get through that trap? Well, you know, I've given hundreds of speeches over the years, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to this day I'll have people come up and say, I remember when you said something 20 years ago. Oh, my. And I'm like amazed that something I said a long time ago, my belief is as you grow, you're not only learning, but you're teaching. And you mm -hmm. don't even know you're teaching by your behavior and, yeah. and the actions that you take and the life that you lead. It's that's, just teaching in itself. That's great. Know? That's great. We're going to come right back. We're okay. going to have a short break. And then when we come back, we'll hear some more about your story, OK? <laughs> OK. Hi, I'm Nicole Alexander Enos, and I was born three weeks ago. Congratulations on being there for me for some of the few weeks of my life. I'm starting a new show, The Millennial Mind, every Wednesday at 2 p.m. for the month of April, where we'll go over some of the reasons why millennials are some of the most anxious and frustrated people at the moment. Ah! Hello, this is Martin Despang. Please join me on my new show, Humane Architecture, like the one in the back that you see by architect David Rockwood. The show is going to be on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii in downtown Honolulu. See you then. 
Welcome back. This is our show on Secrets of Reinvention with New Workforce Hawaii. And our guest today is Jackie Young, Dr. Jackie Young. And Jackie uh, has a, an amazing life. If you missed the first part of this, go back and watch the tape later. Um, she has been telling us about how to get out of mental and physical and job kind of traps and free yourself to do what really is meaningful and purposeful in life. And you know, a lot of people, we go through and we do things that are good for us. We, we get better jobs. We change our job. We go back to school and learn something new and make more money. Well, Jackie has transcended that, and she has chosen to become a public advocate for numerous causes. And I, what I'm going to ask her about now is how she decided to do that. So Jackie, what made you decide to go out and be a public figure on various causes? Well, one of the earliest uh, language gifts, and I call them gifts, when there are quotes or sayings that people do that inspire you, was my grandfather. I was raised by my grandparents, and my grandfather came from Korea in 1904, and he was very political, mm -hmm. and he was um, leader in the Korean community. Oh. He would go around to the different plantation camps and tell people, if you care about your family, you have to care about politics. Mm -hmm. You have to care about what's going on politically, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it's going to trap you. Oh. And I, I would oh. hear that when I traveled around with him. And it didn't really uh, sink in until I began to feel powerless and began to feel like I was not contributing and I was being a spectator and I needed to activate myself. And then it hit me that what my grandfather said way back when I was a child was true. That yeah. if you care about your family, you have to care about politics. Wow. Not just voting. At the minimum, you have right. to vote. Right. But you have to care about the policies that are being written that are going to impact your family. Well, was it scary for you at all to get into that realm? It was. But again, because I had volunteered to work for the Hawaii Women's Political Caucus earlier as uh -huh. a volunteer, and then later I became chair. Mm -hmm. And then when I was chair of the Hawaii Women's Caucus, I had a cancer scare. And I thought I had colon cancer. Oh. And uh, wow. I got a call from the national office asking me to run for national vice president. And I said, well, I can't do that because I may die in six months because I've got oh this God. colon scare. Well, you think oh. that when you yeah. get cancer. Absolutely. And I heard a pause on the other side. And she said, it can't be that bad. Put your, put your resume in. Oh. Run anyway. Wow. And I went, oh. Okay, so I ran for vice president, which I won, no, of the no National kidding. Women's Political Caucus. The next step was, well, hey, you're in, you just moved into a district, and, and somebody there is against the things you believe in. Why don't you run? And I went, well, I just moved into the district. Right. They said, so what? You oh, know, wow. And I thought, okay, you don't have to live a lifetime in a district to care about issues mm -hmm. that affect your family. And mm -hmm. I use that as my theme. So what I'm saying is that your language can trap you mm -hmm. so easily. My mm -hmm. dissertation was about language traps. Right. And they can trap you into thinking this is the way it is or has to be. Right, you know? right. And I have to say, uh, millennials, the young people, will have to worry about that because they're being defined by right. society as what they can or can't do. Mm -hmm. You know, that they're free thinking, that they're above authority, that mm -hmm. they can do whatever they want to. Right. And they will find that that's going to trap them just by right. thinking that way. So they mm -hmm. have to realize that there are things that people say and do that mm -hmm. can trap you. And mm -hmm. you've got to think of a positive way to get out of that. Yeah. That's an excellent point. And I think, you know, um, boomers also are trapped that oh, way. Oh, absolutely. Right? Like we're, we're like self-enlightened and, and we all think that we're going to be young forever, right? Um, yeah. Some of us could actually be young forever if we just don't put the label on. Same thing with millennials. I totally agree with you. But boomers are being trapped already by saying they're entering retirement age yeah. at 65, and they don't have to. No. They don't have to. You know, that's what the government says. You get Medicare at 65. That makes you right. feel old. Right. But it's a gift from government that you get Medicare, yeah. and you can continue. I didn't retire until I was 79. You're still not you know? retired. It's no, in fact, to me. <laughs> I, I still have a goal I'm wanting yeah. to teach at the university uh, yeah. because I have that in my background. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how do I keep myself fresh and is by challenging young people and yeah. hearing what they have to say. So oh, I'm willing to put myself into that arena. Oh, that's again, wonderful. You know. Well, I think, you know, the idea of um, when you were talking about getting into politics, that yeah. You had, you had moments where opportunities came your way and people saw something oh, yeah. with you, yeah. right? And then they, they, they encouraged you, right? Yeah. And, um, and yet now I know that you do that a lot with other people, right? You give it yes. forward, right? You're, you're able yeah. to take the energy that you have 
and you inspire so many people just with what you do. I mean, I yeah, hope you realize that. No, and I don't. I mean, it's afterwards that I find out that I did. If I did, I would stop and think about it probably. It would be too much of a responsibility. <laughs> oh, you'd be scared but, then. Yeah, yeah, there were, well, when I was in the legislature, the issue of marriage equality came up. And people told me not to get involved because right. if I wanted to be reelected, I better stay conservative on that issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it didn't feel right, you mm -hmm. know, because my children had friends who were gay, and I thought this doesn't feel right yeah. to do this. And it's a long story, and it's in my book. But I asked my, um, I asked the people who supported me whether I should get involved, and they said it's going to be political suicide. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it, and I thought that means it's really important. Oh. That means I have to take a big risk, and I'm willing to do it because I believe in it. And so I took that risk, and yes, politically it impacted me, mm -hmm. but it made me feel good that I did the right thing. Right, and, and, it, and it prevailed. Yes, and it prevailed eventually, mm -hmm. but yeah. it was just uh, something I felt you have to take risks. Mm -hmm. you know, and there are responsibilities and consequences, and I suffered them, but I suffered them with my head held up high. That's that right. It was, it was okay. That's right. Well, that's you know? excellent. I mean, excellent advice, and just, yeah. so what you're really saying is, if you were raised, right, not with the great-grandfather that you had that said get into politics, mm -hmm. no matter what your situation, how you were raised, you need to transcend whatever those communications or traps that are in your head and figure out what you really stand for and go and do it, right? right. At any yeah. age. Right. right. When you're a millennial, when you're a Gen Y or whatever right. they're calling that group now, um, all the way up. Yeah, and, and they need to challenge things that they hear. Like in my dissertation, one of the big conceptual traps, and this goes back to my interest in domestic violence mm -hmm. and, and violence against women, right. is I kept hearing men protect women, men mm -hmm. protect women. Well, who do men protect women from? Right. Other men. Right. You know, so there's something wrong with that concept of right. men protect women. So women need to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to take charge of their lives mm -hmm. and step forward and take care of themselves. And that was right. a big trap right. that uh, I'd like to put out there that things like that can really uh, ensnare you. Mm -hmm. And it's important you realize that they're there. So you, you know. just decide once you know I have an opportunity, you just decide, I'm going to go do this. I, I'm weighing all the pros and cons and I'm just going to go and Yeah, sometimes you get sucked in. <laughs> you, you get battered, you know, and you yeah. do that. But then because over the years I've developed a self-confidence in myself, mm -hmm. I know I can get out of it. There you go. That I can move. I can always be a cake decorator. Right. Yeah. I mean, I can. Yeah. I always look at Leonard's That's Bakery right. and go, I can do those cakes. I right. can make roses. I can right. make animals, you know. Yeah. This has been something over 50 years ago, right. and I still have that skill. Yeah. You know, That's so a good point. I never lost that. You yeah. Know? That's so, a good yeah. point. Yeah, I yeah. could always write resumes or help people with LinkedIn or well, something. You know, you know, my first job, Phyllis, was as a reporter for the Honolulu Star Bowl when I was 16 years old. Wow. And when I was given that, that opportunity, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be writing for the world, which at that time was Hawaii, mm -hmm. right? You know, but it gave me the ability to meet deadlines, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to interview people, you know, that were outside of my little circle mm -hmm. and to network with a larger group of people. It was a high school column. But I had that column for four years. Wow. So I was able to really meet a lot of people in the community as a result. Right. right. Yeah. We were talking a few days ago about uh, the networking and the volunteerism and mm -hmm. how it really kind of helps prop you to know mm -hmm. what you might be interested in later, et cetera, right? So it's really important because if you're in a job that are, is kind of junk, yeah. you can still volunteer for something like Habitat for Humanity or Food Bank or right. something that makes you feel you're giving back to the community. And mm -hmm. you'll soon find that your skills in raising money for that nonprofit maybe will come in handy in your career. Absolutely. You know, or the skills of networking or organizing will come, you know, if you want to run for office someday. So all those skills dovetail with each other. Right. Right. Well, I want to hear just a little bit about your book, okay? We have okay. A, a few minutes left, and I know you've been working on your memoir, yes. and it's in various stages of iteration, yes. and um, what is, the title of it right now is The Gifts of Aging? That's the working well, title? Well, that's the subtitle. Actually, oh, the, subtitle. the title is What the Gypsy Said, ah. and it's because when I was 15 years old, I was in Chinatown with my brother and my grandmother, and they had gypsies on the sidewalk right mm -hmm. across from Mofat. They oh. had tables set up with tattoo artists and gypsies on the sidewalk. And I was standing there, and a gypsy came up and grabbed my hand and said, Oh, too bad. You're going to die when you're 25. Oh and my, and God. my brother was shocked that she oh. would say that. And 
And everybody I asked after that said, oh, that was just a silly prophecy. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And I didn't really worry about it, though it sat in the back of my mind till I hit 25. And then when I hit 25, I thought, maybe this is the year I'm going to die. Terrible. You know, and at that time, I was pregnant with my third child and in Germany. Uh -huh. And I thought, this is the year I'm going to die. So it became very um, present in my mind. Mm -hmm. And what happened after that is I began to feel like we really can't take life for granted. We really have to make decisions now. And it crystallized when I read a book about if you had six months to live, how would you live your life? Right. We would be blessed to be able to know we could live six months. Right. Truly, because we true. don't know. Right. And so I used to plan, if I had six months to live, I would run for office. This is the way I was thinking when I was asked to run for office. Well, if I died, I'd be elected and the governor could appoint a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I thought. If I had six months to live, I would do it. Always you thinking know, ahead, I even think though I would gonna, do it. If I had yeah. six months to live, would I do this? If yes. I had six months to live, would I retire? Would I quit? Would I do something else? Mm -hmm. It gives you a long enough span that you can think, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And then one of the last quotes I'll mention is when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, mm -hmm. I sat there in the doctor's office waiting for him to come and tell me the bad news when there was a sign on the, mm -hmm. on the wall that said, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, and that's why it's called the present. Aww. And I s looked at that and I said, whatever happens to me, and I had breast cancer at the time, and that was 1998. Wow. You know, I said I would live the fullest that I could live. Oh, what a wonderful yeah. way to end this segment. But I sure hope that we have a chance to talk to you more. And <laughs> anyone who has the chance to check out Jackie's book when it is published. Hopefully by the end of the year. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, in, and if you are, even before that, you, if you don't know her, look her up on Google, <laughs> LinkedIn. Check this woman out. She is, um, she's had so many different important roles so far in life and we really thank you so much for spending thank your you. time with us today. This is New Workforce Hawaii. Thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.